Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, in welcoming poet Ross Gay to Washington State University. Uh, I'm DJ Lee. I'm a professor in the English department at WSU Pullman, and I'm co-director of the Visiting Writers Series. First of all, I'd like to thank our partners, the English department at WSU Pullman, WSU Tri-Cities, WSU Vancouver, across the whole uh, WSU system. Uh, thank you also to the Common Reading Series, ASWSU, and Land Escapes, the Campus Literary Journal. Big gratitude to our tech wizards, Rob Baker and Brian Varner, and to my partners in this series, the co-director Cameron McGill and our intern Hayden Wallander, who unfortunately can't join us tonight on screen, but I know she's watching. Especially, I'd like to thank you, our esteemed audience, for making time to be with us. Cameron will be monitoring the chat and we'll be running the Q&A after the reading and that's where you're gonna type your burning questions. So we're all from far, far flung places in these viral times and we'd love to see you put in the chat where you're all from. Uh, tonight, I come to you from the homelands of the Nimipu. The Nimipu people and their land is important to me personally for many reasons. And in fact, it's the land on which WSU Pullman sits. Uh, WSU locations statewide are also on homelands of indigenous peoples. And uh, since we celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day earlier this week, I was reminded that land acknowledgements are just one step toward honoring indigenous people's long presence on all US lands and recognizing their continuing connection to the earth, the water, the air, and their ancestors. Ross's reading has direct links to our common reading book this year, Trevor Noah's Born a Crime. And many of you have already read it and you know that it's his, uh, Trevor Noah's account of growing up in South Africa during apartheid. In our own country, we know that people of color face daily racism and violence. And while movements like Black Lives Matter are responding to some of these injustices, artists, poets, and writers like Ross Gay are addressing them as well. If you're here for the common reading event, we will put the Qualtrics link in the chat toward the end of the reading, so watch for that. So now I get to introduce Ross Gay. He's a professor at Indiana University as well as Drew University's Low Residency MFA. He's the recipient of the 2015 National Book Critics Circle Award. And I'm a member of the National Book Critics Circle and I know that's a really hard award to win. So that's a big deal. And he's also the winner of the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award for his book, Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. He has two other poetry books, um, well, three actually, but uh, two that I'll mention right away are Against Witch and Bringing the Shovel Down and a collection of essays called The Book of Delights. And I actually taught the Book of Delights this fall, um, parts of it, to my, and my students and I loved it. So I'm hoping he will give us a, a few uh, pieces from that. His new book, Beholding, was just released. And links to those books and where you can buy them will also be in the chat. Ross is a founding board member of the Bloomington Community, Community Orchard Free Fruit for All Food Justice and Joy Project, and he's received fellowships from Cave Canem, Bread Loaf, and the Guggenheim Foundation. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items. Please use the chat to engage with and respond throughout the reading, as well as to ask questions um, after the reading's over. Uh, live captioning is available in a separate browser window by selecting a captioning link and we will provide that in the chat as well. And I want to give you a heads up for our next event uh, hosted by the Visiting Writer Series and that'll be on February 10th, where we will welcome Chigozi Obiyama, a fiction writer and author of The Fisherman, 
a, which is a, was a finalist for the Man Booker Prize, another really big prize. So um, we'll be really excited to welcome um, Chigozi Obiyama and that'll be a, a YouTube live event. Uh, so look for that on our website. We'll also put um, our website in the chat and we hope to see you there. But for now, please join me in welcoming Ross Gay. Yay. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for that introduction. Um, glad to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read to you um, from two different books. The first, I'm going to read a little bit of this poem, this book, um, this poem. It's one long poem, this book, Beholding. And I'm going to read you the beginning of this book. And, um, you know, one of the things about this book is that it you know, one of the things that it does is it studies this move by a basketball player named Dr. J or Ju named Julius Irvin and named again, Dr. J. Um, and it's a move from the 1980 NBA Finals. And it's, in my opinion, the prettiest basketball move in the NBA anyway, um, ever. And the most beautiful move. Um, and you'll hear me making that argument a little bit. But it's a, that's the sort of thing that I, the poem is sort of looking at, but it's looking at many, many, many other things. And in a way it's a, probably a poem about looking um, among other things. But I have this little, I know that a lot of people um, don't know who Dr. J is. And that, I just wanna sort of address that. About Dr. J, it has occurred to me with much sorrow though I'm getting over it, that not everyone knows who Dr. J, Julius Irving, is. I have learned this over the years as I was trying to write this poem and would occasionally be talking to, shall we say, millennials about what I was working on. Oh, I'd say vaguely, I'm working on a poem about Dr. J. In these encounters, I realized that many of these otherwise decent people had never heard of the doctor though LeBron James at a few owl, they had mostly all at least heard of. This strikes me as a generational ignorance, not a moral one. And for that reason, I begrudge these people or you if you are one of them, not at all. For I have never read Harry Potter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I feel at least in the realm of being a decent person. Anyhow, for this poem to be its most you know, whatever a poem might be to you, it might behoove you to do a tiny bit of research on Dr. J. You could just look at any of the video algorithm machines or watch the movie, The Doctor, a Dr. J documentary narrated by Chuck D. Or better yet, you could just ask an elder, which incidentally, in addition to being someone who knows who Dr. J is, is a kind of tree or shrub from whose ripe black berries you can make a potent antiviral medicine, useful prophylactically and after infection. And there's an epigraph, a little phrase before the poem starts. And the phrase says, to be held, to behold. And that's from Christina Sharp's book, In the Wake. Beholding. And you might've noticed there's nowhere to go the wind cutting little eddies at your collarbone and behind your ear as Dr. J drives from the foul line extended to the baseline, defended valiantly by Mark Landsberger, who in this poem, despite the doofy urge to make him so, is not allegorical, but is rather simply a hardworking journeyman ball player with decent athleticism and size and a floppy mop of dusty blonde hair got caught up in the gust, sliding his size 16s quick so that Doc, after catching the ball at the elbow and taking one hard dribble toward the baseline where the dunk would usually commence, could not access the paint or the lane or the key, which is what we call the area nearest the goal, which in this case is an iron hole drawn in space and therefore implies a window though the key makes it also a door that Landsberger, it seemed, was trying to keep shut. And so Doc left, he left his seat, 
which means more or less jumping with the ball with nowhere to go, and which we're warned against by coaches from day one for the ensuing requisite stupid pass or more simply though no less stupid travel, also called walking, which the leaping often leads to. Keep your feet again and again, which makes the leaping, leaving your feet, sound sacrificial. The way in certain places, certain countries or countries inside of countries, you must leave by foot with nowhere to go, which there is. And Doc, you should note, after the one dribble, clasps the ball with only his right hand, without once at all in any shape or form using the left, which, among other things, friends, differentiates this move from all the descendant moves. Kevin Durant, Dwayne Wade, Steph, and Giannis, and Harden, and Kawhi. Yes, Bron, Bron, too. I shall not be moved. And using only one hand, which is amazing, but not yet miraculous, more a physical and therefore genetic fact. Thanks, Bon Pa Irvin. Doc's hand becomes an octopus, gripping the ball nothing like prey. And with that ball snugged in his mitt, Doc maybe kind of sort of thought something like, I am going to put this schmuck, the schmuck in this case being Landsberger, though please do not revert to a simplistic allegorization of the journeyman, which word I repeat advisedly, on a poster. Though schmuck is a word I'd be surprised to hear Doc say. And the word posterize, common usage posterize his ass, you might be thinking is a bit of an anachronism in this poem, in this move, which ostensibly occurred in the 1980 NBA Finals. Though we all know that nothing happens only when it happens. We all know nothing happens only when it happens. Emerging more in the epic, which in the NBA lasts three to five years, following Doc's retirement. Hakeem the Dream and Clyde the Glide, Barkley the Glove, and yo, remember Sean Kemp? Though Doc probably thought it anyway, visionary that he was, when will they verb what I keep doing to be schmucks, especially Bill fucking Walton? Driving from the foul line extended toward the baseline as the unsuspected Landsberger, who did a fine job of shuffling his size 16s and not holding, keeping Irving from the key, and who must for a scant and fleeting moment have felt a degree of pride when Doc after the hard dribble right, left his feet with nowhere to go. Billy Cunningham, the coach on the sideline, his hands on his hips, his sport coat thrown open, a few strands of hair stuck to his pink brow, and almost smiling as Doc began sailing out of bounds over the baseline. And Landsberger, a southern leaper, skied and foreclosed the possibility of Doc sneaking a shot in this side of the basket, by which I mean dunking probably quite hard, by putting his hand against the backboard, a big door swinging shut. At which fine and commendable defensive effort, Irving simply decided in the air to knock on other doors by soaring more. Have you ever decided anything in the air? I'll pause there. And that goes on for another, oh, 100 pages. Um, now I'm going to read a few essays from this book called The Book of Delights. Um, so a lot of you, it sounds like, are familiar with this book. Um, basically, the way this book came to me, I was, um, I was actually in the midst of sort of <laughs> a little moment of having a nice, a delightful day. I was in the, in the midst of delight. And I thought, oh, I should write a little essay about this. And then I thought um, immediately, um, oh, maybe you should write an essay every day about being delighted and do it for a year. And so that's what this book is. It's a kind of uh, record of that kind of inquiry. I started on my birthday. I ended on my birthday. And here's some of those. This is called The High Five from Strangers, Etc. Again, these are all things that delight me. The high five from strangers, etc. cetera. And, and in this book, I have these long sort of parentheticals. So occasionally they, they, you know, they're 
these kind of digressions. Today, I was wandering the square of the small Indiana town where I gave a poetry reading at the local college. A feature of the small town Midwest, a city hallish building in the center, always with some sad statue trumpeting one war or another. This one had a guy in one of those not very protective looking hats they called a helmet during World War I. He's carrying, naturally, a gun. Jenna Osman's book, Public Figures, alerted me to the ubiquity of the gun, the weapon, in the hands of our statue. A delight I wish to now imagine and even impose, given that beneficent dictatorship, of one's own life anyway, is a delight. All new statues must have in their hands flowers or shovels or babies or seedlings or chinchillas. We could go on like this for a while. But never again, never ever gun. I decree it. And I also decree the removal of the already extant gun. Let the emptiness our war heroes carry be the metaphor for a while. As I was finishing circling the square, I passed a storefront garage with huge Make America Great Again signs. It was a foreign auto repair shop, and inside were mostly Toyotas and Hondas. I settled into the coffee shop, took my notebooks out, and I was reading over these delights, transcribing them into my computer. And while I was working, headphones on, swaying to the new De La Soul record, Delight, which deserves its own entry, I noticed a white girl. She looked 15, but could have been, I suppose, a college student. Standing next to me with her hand raised, I looked up, confused, pulled my headphones back, and she said, like a coach or something, working on your paper, good job to you, high five. And you better believe I high five that child and her pre-ripped Def Leppard shirt and her itty bitty, itty bitty Doc Martin. For I love, I delight in, unequivocally pleasant public physical interactions with strangers. What constitutes pleasant is no secret, is informed by my large-ish male and cisgender body, a body that is also large-ish male, cisgender and not white. In other words, the pleasant, the delightful are not universal. We should all understand this by now. A few months ago, Walking down the street in Umberto Day in Italy, a trash truck pulled up beside me and the guy in the passenger seat yelled something I didn't understand. I said, como? The Spanish word for come again, which is a ridiculous thing to say because even if he had come again, I would not have understood him. He knew this and hopping out of the truck to dump in a couple cans, he flexed his muscles, pointed at me and smacked my biceps hard, twice. I loved him. Or when a waitress puts her hand on my shoulder, forget it if she calls me honey, baby even better. Or someone scooting by puts their hand on my back, the handshake, the hug, I love them both. Once I was getting on a plane and shuffling down the aisle, I saw sitting at the front of coach, my great uncle Earl. I got down on my knees and put my hand on his forearm and I said, uncle Earl, it's me, bro. He looked at me kind of quizzically as did the woman traveling with him who did not look one bit like my Aunt Sylvia, which made me look back at my not Uncle Earl, who looked maybe like my Uncle Earl's second cousin 20 years ago. And though it was benign and no one was hurt, it was a little weird and they looked confused. All the same, given his Uncle Earl died about six months later, I'm glad I got to see him and touch him gently lovingly, about a thousand miles away. I want to read you this one. It's called Nicknames. <clears throat> um, I mentioned letterpress and letterpress is a kind of um, printing. Um, it's the old ways that newspapers and books were made and Actually, these machines behind me are called letter presses. That machine is called a skateboard, but these machines are called letter presses. Um, nicknames. I'm writing in a notebook with the words, pay attention, printed on the front. 
which is a cousin to another notebook in my bag with the words, pay attention, motherfucker, printed on it. From a printed on a Chandler and Price letterpress that I co-own with my friend, which I have yet to see, for it is lodged in a print shop in Lubbock, Texas. My beloved co-owner pal, which makes him a kind of spouse, I suppose, who gifted me these delightful notebooks is named Boogie, or Boogs, and was so named by me, one of my greatest literary achievements. Boogie, or Boogs, might not be the first name you'd assign to Boogie, or Boogs, for a number of reasons, perhaps the most significant of which is that he has probably, he has definitely not spent a whole lot of time dancing. Boogie, which you might ascertain from his appearance, which would be a wrong thing to do, though you'd be right. This is one of the reasons Boogie or Boogs is such a great nickname. It's a kind of curveball that has, with much repetition, become utterly natural. And his Christian name, Curtis, has come to seem awkward and clunky, kind of Lutheran, kind of curt. It's a clothesline of a name, really, the football kind. Another reason I love this nickname and have now come to love how much I love this nickname is because Boogie doesn't know that every time I say his name, I am also invoking the great and similarly nicknamed L. Boogie, or Lauren Hill, whom I am guessing wrongly, probably rightly, Boogie has never boogied to. Boogie calls me Salpicon, which he tells me means sizzle, which I think fits. Though it would be a safe assumption, given my own delight, that the nickname Salty Cone might afford Boogie some similar pleasurable ironic association, which I don't need to know about. I've shortened my nickname to Picon, whatever that means. Anyway, I love nicknames. They delight me. There are evidently people from whom nicknames are repelled like projectiles from Luke Cage's skin. Fried eggs to Teflon. My friend Patrick is one of them. Though the simple Spanishification of his name, Patricio, time to time among some of us, is one that has endured, sort of, time to time. Drop the pa, jiggle the spelling, and it might be a good sticky name. Patricio, one that in a generation or two might become associated incorrectly and beautifully and so correctly with something arboreal, something to do with trees. How beautiful is that? I am a bit of a nickname magnet and have been assigned the following aliases. Biz Quick, Biz, Rahim the Compassionate, Beef, Beefy, Big Man, Bigs, Biggie, Big Lil Big, Big Papa, The Big Gay, Bones, Baby Boy, Baby Gay, The Baby, Booger, Beef, Sammy, Saucy, Saucy Sauce, Saucy Pants, Dr. Sauce, Dr. Hot Sauce, Doc the Doctor, Tall Lady, Tall Drink, Wave, Aros Con Pollo, Ross the Boss, the King of Applesauce, Roski, Schnauzer, Six, Safe, Unky, Daddy, and several others too lewd or private to share. I don't know exactly what nicknames mean, though a quick reading of mine in the abundance of the B sound, that babyest of sound, makes me think it might be primal. I know that I rarely call the people I love by their names. I call them, if it's okay with them, by the name I have given them. I wonder if this means I think of my beloveds as my children. That seems patronizing, especially given that I don't give them money. But on the other hand, how lovely all my mothers, all my babies. This is called an abundance of public toilets. I love an abundance of public toilets. I delight in that. I don't mean this delight to diminish the dignity violating absence of public toilets, public bathrooms in New York City, which is a failure and a carelessness, a ruthlessness in fact, that reminds me somehow that ours is a country where property is more valued than people are. Nor do I want this delight, which was occasioned by the lavatorial deprivation New York City is, which every one of you has a friend with a bad story about, to be a delight about deprivation. 
though it might be that deprivation and the alleviation or deprivation of that deprivation is one of the sources of delight. Source is the wrong word. One of the flashlights upon delight, the unveilers, the ticklers, some word that explains how delight originates in the delighted is what I mean. And it's simply stimulated or awakened. Not too long ago, I was buying some lumber at the local hardware store to build a raised bed. It was summer, melon season, a time of year I tend to be abundantly hydrated. As I was sliding my two by 12s into the car, I realized I really needed to pee, like really, really. But for some reason, I felt shy asking to use the loo. I wanted an espresso anyway, and I figured I'd just pull into the bakery around the corner, except when I got there, all the parking was taken. And now it was bad, real bad. And so I started looking around for abandoned buildings or little clutches of trees where I could piss, but I had no luck being more or less downtown. Not to mention the muscles of my mid and lower back were starting to seize up with whatever taxing physiological business clamps the urethra shut. I had a friend once who had to pee real bad, but being a new guy at a law firm in a meeting that wouldn't stop, he held it in for a very long time until the meeting did finally stop. And while removing his member from his slacks at the urinal, he fainted. I will never forget this story. And given his mind as a public occupation and mine as a small town, I thought better of pulling into the parking lot next to the family video on Grimes Street, letting loose against the wall and full view of everyone on Gr I thought better of pulling into the parking lot next to the family video and letting loose against the wall and full view of everyone on Grimes Street. One of them, of course, an old student who got a C minus, capturing my indecent drainage with his phone for later upload. I chose instead to pee my pants in my car. I peed and peed in my pants my shorts in my car. And then I peed some more. The word chose there made the not exactly accident seem more volitional than it really was. Though driving while in a bathroom panic is unsafe. And so I approve of my choice for that reason too. Regardless, the delight of the car peeing was in the alleviation of the mental and physical anguish of holding the pee in. It was a deprivation of a deprivation. And the delight, for it was a delight as the vinyl seats of my Subaru became a pool of well hydrated urine, would not have occurred had the original deprivation, having to pee and nowhere to do it, not occurred. Yeah, yeah, some shame and such. This essayette's helping me work it out. I fully understand that this delight and what is coming to look like an appeal to you to view it as such might not be a delight for you. Delight is like that. All the same, it seems illuminating. And so it was that when I was in Greenwich Village, again, well hydrated, but this time from coffee, without a bathroom, and I asked the barista where he might urinate if he couldn't pee in the place where he just spent four and a half bucks for a short fucking Americano. He pointed to the park across the street, which had a porta potty. When I entered, I found that it was a very clean porta potty, and urinating, I noticed for the first time, standing up and kind of tall like I am, that the tops of porta potties have screens that you can look out of, which I did, like I was in a confessional, like I was a priest, watching the parishioners walk by as the noon bells to the nearby church started to ring. I'm gonna read you a couple more of these. This is called Tomato On Board. Well, you don't know until you carry a tomato seedling through the airport and onto a plane, is that carrying a tomato seedling through the airport and onto a plane will make people smile at you almost like you're carrying a baby, a quiet baby. I did not know this until today, carrying my little tomato, about three or four inches high in its four inch plastic starter pot which my friend Michael gave to me, smirking about how I was going to get it home. Something about this at first felt naughty, not comparing a tomato to a baby, 
but carrying the tomato onto the plane. And so I slid the thing into my bag while going through security, which made them pull the bag for inspection. When the security guy saw it was a tomato, he smiled and said, I don't know how to check that. Have a good day. But I quickly realized that one of its stems, which I almost wrote as arms, was broken from the jostling. And it only had four of them, so I decided I'd better just carry it out in the open. And the shower of love began. It was a shower of love I also felt while carrying a bouquet of lilies to the streets of Rome last summer. People, maybe women especially, maybe women my age-ish and older especially, smiling with approval. A woman in a house dress beating out a rug on a balcony shouted, Bravo! An older couple holding hands both smiled at me and pulled into each other, knitting their fingers together. My showers might have been disappointed to know I was not giving the lilies to a sweetheart, but, had, but to my friends, Damiano and Moira, who had translated a few of my poems into Italian and were so kind as to let me stay at their place a couple of nights while I was passing through. On the way to the vegetarian restaurant Damiano's ex-wife owns with her partner, we walked by what I'm pretty sure Damiano said was the biggest redbud tree in the world. It stretched for yards lounging periodically onto the mossy earth. Its beautiful black bark glistened by the streetlights. Though translation is an act of love, so my showers needn't be disappointed at all. Before boarding the final leg of my flight, one of the workers said, nice tomato, which I don't think was a come on. And the flight attendant asked me about the tomato at least five times, not an exaggeration, every time calling it my tomato. Where's my tomato? How's my tomato? You didn't lose my tomato, did you? She even directed me to an open seat in the exit row. Why don't you guys go sit there and stretch out? I gathered my things and set the little guy in the window seat so she could look out. When I got my water, I poured some into the little guy's soil. When we got bumpy, I put my hand on the little guy's container, careful not to snap another arm off. And when we landed and the pilot put the brakes on hard, my arm reflexively went across the seat, holding the little guy in place, the way my dad's arm would when we had to brake hard in that car without seatbelts to speak of, in one of my very favorite gestures in the Encyclopedia of Human Gestures. And I'm going to read you one more. This one is called... Um, Loitering. I'm sitting at a cafe in Detroit where in the door window is the sign with the commands, no soliciting, no loitering, stacked like an anvil. I have a fiscal relationship with this establishment, which I developed by buying a coffee and which makes me a patron. And so even though I suddenly dozed in the late afternoon sun pouring under the awning, the two bucks spent protects me, at least temporarily, from the designation of loiterer. Though the dozing, if done long enough, or ostentatiously enough, or with enough delight, might transgress me over. Loitering, as you know, means fucking off, or doing jack shit, or jacking off. And given that two of those three terms have sexual connotations, it's no great imaginative leap to know that it is a repressed and repressive, sexual and otherwise, culture, at least, that invented and criminalized the concept. Someone reading this might very well keel over considering loitering a concept and not a fact. Such are the gales of delights. The Webster's definition of loiter reads thus, to stand or wait around idly without apparent purpose, and to travel indolently with frequent pauses. Among the synonyms for this behavior are linger, loaf, laze, lounge, lollygag, dawdle, amble, saunter, meander, putter, dilly-dally, and mosey. Any one of these words in the wrong frame of mind might be considered critique or noun epithet lollygagger or you loafer. 
Indeed, lollygag was one of the words my mom would use to cajole us while jingling her keys when she was waiting for us, which, judging from the visceral response I had while writing that memory, must have been not quite infrequent. All of these words to me imply having a nice day. They imply having the best day. They also imply being unproductive, which leads to being, even if only temporarily, non-consumptive. And this is a crime in America, and more explicitly criminal depending upon any number of quickly apprehended visual cues. For instance, the darker your skin, the more likely you are to be loitering. Though a Patagonia jacket could do some work to disrupt that perception. A Patagonia jacket, colorful pants, tree-torn sneakers with short socks, an Ivy League ball cap, and a thick book, not the Bible, and you're almost golden. Almost. There is a Venn diagram someone might design, several of them, that will make visual our constant internal negotiation for safety. And like the best comedy, it will make us laugh hard before saying, Lord. It occurs to me that laughter and loitering are kissing cousins, as both bespeak an interruption of production and consumption. And it's probably for this reason that I have been among groups of non-white people laughing hard who have been shushed in a Cadoba in Bloomington, in a bar in Fishtown, in the Harvard Club at Harvard. The shushing perhaps reminds how threatening to the order are our bodies in non-productive, non-consumptive delight. The moment of laughter not only makes consumption impossible, you might choke, but if the laugh is hard enough, if the shit talk is just right, food or drink might fly from your mouth. If not, then this kind of hurts your nose. And if your body is supposed to be one of the consumables, if it has been, if it is one of the consumables, around which so many ideas of production and consumption have been structured in this country. Well, there you go. There is a Carrie Mae Weems photograph of a woman in what looks to be some kind of textile factory with an angel embroidered to the left breast of her shirt where her heart resides. The woman, like the angel, has her arms splayed wide, almost in ecstasy, as though to embrace everything. So in the midst of her glee is she. Every time I see that photo, after I smile and have a genuine feeling of delight, a genuine bodily opening on account of witnessing this delight, which is a moment of black delight, I look behind her for the boss. Uh-oh, I think, you're in a moment of non-productive delight, heads up. Which points to another of the synonyms for loitering, which I almost wrote as delight, taking one's time. For while the previous list of synonyms allude to time, taking one's time makes it kind of plain. For the crime of loitering, the idea of it is about ownership of one's own time, which must be sometimes wrested from the assumed owners of it, who are not you, back to the rightful who is. And while having interpolated the policing of delight such that I am on the lookout for the overseer, even in photos I have studied hundreds of times, on the lookout always for the policer of delight, my work is studying this kind of glee, being on the lookout for it, and aspiring to it, floating away from the factory, as she seems to be. Thank you. Ross, that was so wonderful. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah, Thank you're you welcome. For, Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, yeah. and for the, the gift of, that both of these books are. Um, we've got some, some questions coming in and I just wanted to get us started. Uh, uh, I've, I've been thinking a bit about poetry and music that in both of these books that you read from tonight, especially with, with Donny Hathaway's presence uh, in both, both Delights and Beholding. That's um, right. 
I'm sure. interested. I'm interested in the idea of, the, of a shared dialogue between poems and songs um, and how we experience each one as, as kin to the other. Um, mm. So in today's creative writing class um, visit, you mentioned your interest in the depth and quiet that we make art in, um, mm. which is a beautiful line. It made me think about a quote, which I, I think is attributed to Miles Davis, that great art comes from great stillness. Uh, and yeah. I'm, I'm, just, I'm interested how you see both stillness and music as part of your creative process as a means of bringing attention and resonance and as two different but complementary engines you know, at work in a poem, which I, I see it work in, in your poetry and prose. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful question. I feel like, um, I feel like stillness is one of the, I mean, even that idea um, that that a lot of what we're actually, um, you know, earlier today, I think I was talking to the class and talking about like being able to listen to something I don't know how to listen to yet. Like that's the metaphor that I like right now for trying to sort of, you know, get to where the poem is, you know, kind of compositionally listening to listening to the thing that I don't yet know how to listen to, which makes it, which is a compelling, a very compelling sort of uh, practice or exercise or whatever you call it um, for me. And part of that listening, I think another word for that listening would be silence, you know, it might be that, that it's a sort of inhabitation of a silence where there are other kinds of um, voices or knowings or something available. And um, so that's, that's the first part of it. The second part, you know, it's funny, like I, you know, I wasn't like a, um, a school kid at all. Like I wasn't a writer or a reader. I read comic books and I read, and I read the um, jackets to records um, <clears throat> very closely. And so, you know, like, all of the songs on Earth, Wind and Fire's greatest hits, like I have those memorized or very specific ones, you know, that my, my dad, mom and dad had records. My dad had a lot of records and I would sit there and I didn't read books, but I, uh, I read Power Man and Iron Fist. And, but besides that, I was, I read, um, I read, uh, yeah, record labels and a record, um, the lyrics and, I was just sitting um, the other day and like any time, like there's these, this collection of records, of music, al albums, whatever we call them now, tapes, they were tapes that I listened to so closely and are so deeply ingrained in my mind. And they are like Tracy Chapman's Fast Car, um, The Joshua Tree, um, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, um, De La Soul, Three, Foot, Three Feet High and Rising, um, you know, there's like a handful of these records, um, some that are like, um, you know, not a lot of people would know who they are, like Basha, you know, kind of a jazz vocalist, but I was like oh. deep in Basha, I love Basha. And like some of these other, there's like a handful of people, but like, I listened to these records so closely. And when I listened, I mean, the other night, I was just sort of like listening to Tracy Chapman, that, that record, like watching video of her. And I was like, oh, not only are some of the sort of political and ethical concerns that she's writing about totally what I'm interested in a certain kind of way, that her way of like making language is, is, um, has totally informed me, as has listening to Public Enemy has totally informed me and De La Soul. And in fact, just the other day I was, I was watching, studying, De La Soul, like a concert, a live performance from 2019. They're still performing, they're really good. And um, I was listening to a lyric and they, the lyric is something like, um, um, they say the meek shall inherit the, or they say, they say the milk, meek shall inherit the earth, but it's the poor, are, the poor are the ones who shall inherit the debt. And I have this construction in the beholding poem that just yesterday when I, when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's right. <laughs> I got this construction. <laughs> I basically said it was a, it was a De La Soul lyric from, yeah. I don't know how old the song is, but it was so in my ear that it, you know, yeah. that it comes out. 
Um, so that's all to say that like, you know, to answer around some of those questions, but, you know. Oh, oh thank you very much. That's, that's great. I, I love, uh, those, those are fun moments. Totally fun. And there, there's one more thing that I was thinking about too. Like, um, I've been listening a lot, uh, uh, this, uh, this guy who's uh, in the graduate program here, he was telling me like he grew up and his dad, every single morning, his dad plays um, Coltrane's My Favorite Thing. And I said, which one? And he said, what do you mean? And he was like, the, the recording. And I was like, oh, I was like, you never heard the other one? <laughs> and I was like, cause I, I only listen to the other one. And then, <laughs> so I started listening to, to the Coltrane stuff and I was like, oh, this is, I often think, like I, I, I'm sort of very interested in the digression as a, as a mode of thinking and writing and whatever, being. And I often think, well, that's because my teachers are like people like Gerald Stern, you know, who are sort of digressive poets and individuals. But then I was listening to like these live Coltrane recordings and I was like, you know, who, who I've studied deeply, like John Coltrane is someone who I've just studied deeply. I was like, no, actually, I probably really learned digression by listening to all these, you know, recordings of John Coltrane, who digression was just, and, and it also feels like when he was digressing, he was inhabiting a space where he was listening to something that no one else knew how to listen to. And I think that something that no one else knew how to listen to might constitute a kind of silence. You know, mm. it's both a sound and a silence, I think, that he's he's at, you know, in some way, you know. But anyway, that question yeah. makes me think about a lot of stuff. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk music anytime. That, that's a beautiful answer. <laughs> uh, we, we have a lot of questions coming in. And uh, okay. uh, I'll start with uh, with Arabelle's. Um, um, in the acknowledgments for beholding, um, you quote, um, the preparation for pain is minimal for joy a lifetime. This comes through in your attention, and by attention, I mean fascination, curiosity to the natural world, and dare I say, delights in your work. How do you balance the joy, delight with the pain? Um, to me, like joy holds the pain. Um, when I talk about joy, I, you know, I'm talking about the sort of grown up, um, um grown up is the word that the phrase that always comes grown up i like that as a word the word that always comes to mind when i talk when i think about joy um which which kind of differentiates it from a thing like delight maybe although like in the in the this little book of delights i'm sort of theorizing delight as a thing that maybe always implies its opposite and that that might be like sort of my mood mm -hmm. or or that might actually be the case but joy the way that i think of it um is is made of our sorrow and um and in a way it's sort of like what are we able to do in the midst of caring for each other's sorrows you know like honestly sort of residing in the place where our our sorrows are and our sorrows become maybe mutual or maybe not exactly mutual but um related or something and it seems to me that like I'm interested in the idea that jo joy is the place where we not only acknowledge that, but we sort of enter into the holding of each other's sorrows, um, mm -hmm. which to me feels like the most abundant, um, sort of profoundly, like deeply, um, you know, it is, happiness isn't quite, happiness doesn't hold it. I mean, joy is the word that I think of that, but it's also like the other kinds of words that, touch on that to me are things like gratitude and things like love you know when you're sort of um you know when you're sort of entering into a place of holding the sorrows of trying to enter the place of holding the sorrows um and having your sorrows held it sort of suggests to me like um an understanding or an attempt to understand and practice indebtedness that we are indebted we are beholden to one another and the beholdenness to me uh is what constitutes joy and the beholdenness is not like happy happy the beholdenness is like this is the this is like 
the beautifully grave fact that we are going, we will die, but we love will, you know, maybe die. You know, at some point we'll probably die. Um, sorrow is going to be part of our lives. It is. Um, and yet we can hold each other. We can hold each other's sorrow. Um, and from that, you know, what, what blooms or what blossoms. So, so when I think of joy, I'm always thinking about sorrow is right. When I say joy, I'm thinking of sorrow. Hmm. Um, uh, we have a, a question from Clara. Um, how, how do you uh, play with garden uh, metaphors while working in these uh, more realistic ideas and occasionally darker themes? You make something sound so elegant while also being in a way tragic. Um, hmm. I, and garden, garden was in quotes, so I, I think in some ways, you know, think, talking about the tomato, but also um, how gardening as a practice of joy appears in so much of your work. Um, yeah, I feel like it's just one of the places where I'm able to really study, um, think about cycles, um, think about, you know, living and dying and changing and, um, and also like the sort of you know, when I think about that joy, like the, my favorite metaphor thus far is like mycelial, um, you know, network beneath the, in a, in a, a healthy forest, like all the sort of fungal mm -hmm. connections that is a constant cycling of nutrients um, and communication. Mm -hmm. um, and so those metaphors and I mean, those facts and then those facts sort of like thought about in terms of our own relationships and our own living those are really interesting to me. And um, I also feel like there's probably, there is something kind of moving about my experience of being in a garden or, or engaging with, you know, plants and, and the soil. Um, it does feel like you're, you know, it, well, I mean, it, many things, it's sort of, um, you know, if you kind of like no seeds or something, there's something like, what a good metaphor. <laughs> What a good, what a good like example of like what a metaphor is actually, you know, because like I can have a seed that, you know, that is so small, you know, the size of like a freckle or something. And that seed within that seed can literally be, um, you know, inside of that seed is not only, say it's a, say it's a kale plant or something, is not only um, a big hardy kale plant, but inside of that the seed is that kale plant, which then makes maybe say a thousand seeds. And that might be an underestimate, but say it makes a thousand seeds. So there's a thousand seeds inside of this seed. And then those seeds, if they all make a thousand seeds, boom, that's like, I don't know, maybe a million. <laughs> <Someone knows. laughs> but the amount inside of a seed that like in two growing seasons could be, that could actually be, you know, the food for my neighborhood, you know, and that's a, that's a beautiful metaphor to know that this little teeny thing contains within it all of the sort of material, like it's all inside of that seed. Um, you know, that's kind of magic. That's kind of magic to me. And also to know that 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 um, that seed comes after the flowers bloom, and you know, and then the seeds come, and it's you know, toward, often toward, sometimes toward the end of the season, and and then you might you know lay that plant down on the top of the soil to decompose and feed the soil. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, that's beautiful. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I, we'll, we'll, get a, we'll get a quick one here. Uh, uh, Colin has a, has a poetry adjacent question. What is ripe or growing in the Bloomington Orchard right now? We're pretty close to the end, although there are these um, these little fruits called jujubes, um, and they're they're um, like a tart, or not a tart, kind of a like a little appleish, like a tiny little beautiful fruit. They're right at the end. Um, you know, we have fig trees, and like our figs almost always always almost ripen, but they have a hard time getting all the way. So <laughs> and it's supposed to go down to like 30 tonight, and so uh, <laughs> you might not make it. You know. Um, there's probably some apples still hanging on the tree, maybe a little bit. Um, in a way, we have black blackberries, and blackberries tend to be like the biggest, like very reliable. They don't get diseases, you know. Um, so those are some things. 
sure. And then there's always like, there's always herbs and stuff kind of growing around there. You can always get like mint or some other kind of medicine or herb. All right. Uh, uh, Rachel asks, hi Ross, I'm, I'm curious about how your writing process and search for delight has evolved as the world becomes more and more challenging. Uh, I, I so appreciate you, you're an epic delight. So thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Um, You know, like one of the things I feel um, um, even in terms of this sort of like let's say the project of this book, I feel like i mean one of the, one of the one of the neat discoveries in writing that book was that in the midst of um, in the midst of um, regardless, I was sort of like my job for the year was to be like, yeah and like what what's delightful you know like eh, all this all the shit that's going on and it's like but you know just you got 30 minutes to write this thing about that what's delightful <laughs> you gotta go do it because <laughs> you're writing this book and you know in a way it's kind of like to me it feels like um well i kind of have two things that i think about that one is that you know um doing it by yourself is is kind of difficult like i find that like it feels very nice to be in some kind of community whatever that means um for you where someone might be like you know um um hey those uh you know the grapes <laughs> the grapes right next to you are like really right you might want to have a great you know like, oh, I didn't notice the grapes, you know. It's, it's nice for someone to be like, hey, check that out. Or to be like, um, you know, there's a goldfish, <laughs> there's a goldfish like right in front of your face, like, check it out. Like, hey, hummingbirds are coming around. Um, like those kinds of things. And, and, and I know my own experience is that there are times when I need someone else to be like, hey, you know, um, check out, check out what, um, what, what beauty you are amidst or is happening mm -hmm. in your in your orbit um that being said um there it feels like one of the um sort of studies or practices of this book is to you know i've been thinking a lot about witness and how we witness how how we witness makes the world and so um so witness mm -hmm. is a kind of poesis or making mm -hmm. And it feels to me more and more ethically imperative that to the extent that we're able to articulate, to notice and articulate the way that our lives are made possible. And, and we know the way, ways that our lives are made impossible. Um, but it feels like if, you know, and I'm trying to sort of I'm thinking about this constantly, but it feels like, you know, you need to know that to the extent that you need to survive. But, but what it seems to me, what we need to study is how we care for one another. And we need to study how we love one another. And we need to study um, the, the, the many ways that we are in the midst of a kind of um, uh, fabric of tenderness, you know, we need to, you know, and it can be, and it's often, you know, these minor sort of gestures, but part of it, part of the studying it is to be like, oh, that's the thing. That's the thing. That's the thing that I want um, our lives to be like, you know? So I feel, I feel like in the midst of everything, um, articulating what you love and sharing what you love um, is, is, you know, is, just, you know, it's like a, a practice that I'm really committed to. And I feel like it's a practice that, um, the practice of imagining the world that I want to live in, mm. you know, yeah. which often is here, which often is here, which often is the world, mm -hmm. you know, in glimmers or glimpses or, you know, gestures or touches, or um, it, is, it is the world that, you know, witnesses. So, so figuring out how to witness that and be like, oh, that's, that's, that's it. Yeah, that, that, 
that, that, made, uh, that made me think about uh, Nikki Finney's um, uh, blurb on the back of the book about there, there are no idle spectators in beholding. Right. Um, right. Hearing right. you talk about witness, I, I, it's um, I can't help but think about how the poem asks us to look so closely and celebrate the, the ways that spectators can be spectators of joy, but also to consider and acknowledge how people are spectators, as in standing by, watching, yeah. object, objectifying. Um, yeah. I'm thinking of the fire escape collapse photograph and yeah. the photographer yeah, yeah. in yeah. those moments. Can, can you talk right. a little bit about how that 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 balance uh, there's that balance between the need for testimony and witness um in a responsible yeah yeah i mean and that's sort of what feels like the question how mm. how do we i mean because just the fact of like being there to see a thing is vital mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and um but maybe the how maybe that when i say the how um part of what i'm imagining or, or wondering is um is is our witness is our witness sort of um um intended to um you know correct um imagine otherwise to just so be like this happened um is it is it um intended to replicate is our witness intended to, um, or maybe not even intended to replicate, but it, but does it replicate, you know? Um, um, there are plenty of ways that I think that we witness and part of our witness is, is to sort of reinscribe the violence that is being witnessed or to reinscribe the horror that is being witnessed. Um, and, you know, that's like a, that feels like a really vital, um question you know and it's particularly in a i mean at all times probably but in a in a um culture of spectacle you know um yeah uh, and that's so like one of the things that the book the book is asking you know like what are you looking at the book keeps on asking the long poem it keeps on asking what are you looking at what are you looking at you know how are you looking what are you looking at yeah, um, we we have a question about um, asking if you could could speak briefly about your poem, a small needful fact, and its continued impact and, and resonance, and and um, and maybe even connecting to several of the moments in beholding where you you stop us and and give us like an imperative to breathe, and the poem ends mm -hmm. we can breathe, you know, like this mm -hmm. that idea of the breath being carried um, over such a long sustained time, but yet being such a short act is such a short and necessary act. But mm. yeah, you know, I just um, um, I see those connections between those the poems, mm. Um, mm. and I feel like they have very similar kinds of um, questions in them. I think it's interesting. Mm. Um, I'm also very interested in the small needful fact. Um, is really being a poem about life. And I think that's sort of the, that's the, um, that's, that's what's really, um, feels really important to me about that poem, that it's such a poem about life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We, we point, someone pointed out something in, in class uh, when we were going through that poem that, even trying to read through that poem in a single breath is difficult mm. to do. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the act of breathing is, 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 is embedded into the poem in a way where like, it, it, you take one big breath and try to read the whole poem without mm -hmm. stopping. It, mm -hmm. It's almost difficult to do. And yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah uh, it's such a, a beautiful and heartbreaking poem. Um, I, I'm gonna switch to a couple other questions here. Um, I think we're doing all right on time. By that, I have absolutely no idea when we're supposed to be done. <laughs> what, 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 uh, who's running this thing? Um, let's see here. Um, uh, Cameron says, uh, 
you say you weren't a, a school kid when you were younger, so I'm wondering when and how and with which writers and books that started to change. Uh, who mm. turned you into a reader, uh, into a poet? And uh, related to that, how do you think that not too hyper literary beginning has served your writing? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I th I don't know. That's it. I mean, one thing I can say is that I think it was my yeah, it was my second year of college. I was not doing much in this class. I you know I wasn't. I went to college to play football, and I wasn't. Um, I wasn't into school. I didn't know how to be into school, and and football wasn't going good, and um, and I just wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't doing well, and. Um, I had a professor named David Johnson who um, I think it was a like a survey of American poetry or something like that class and he had me give a presentation on Amiri Baraka and mm. we read a poem of his called An Agony as Now mm. and it is a poem that um, to this day like I read it and, I, and I'm still kind of puzzled and moved and puzzled by it mm. at the same time like I, I I couldn't be like oh yeah it's a poem about this um, but I it it does articulate in some way the feelings I was having of alienation, of like, you know, rage and confusion about the the idea of race and uh, class and uh, but alienation. I think the first line of the poem is "I am inside someone who hates me," um, and that that poem i think it's pretty much like you know there were other things happening but i read that poem and i was just and thought about it and and was pretty quickly like oh i want to write poems too i want to do that um and then i started reading you know a lot and really widely and um you know um sylvia plath and june jordan and mark strand and all kinds of all kinds of writers I feel like um, I feel uh, Retke. I feel like mm -hmm. I was um, by not being a bookish kid. I don't know. I wonder if there was some way that um, you know, like <laughs> but like I was twenty years old. And I was like, man, books are cool. Like, check out these books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I don't know, maybe that's kind of neat. Like, it was really exciting, you know. I mean, my dad was reading it all the time. So it's not like we were in a house like with, you know, books, like, constantly. My dad was always <laughs> reading books. And um, so it wasn't like, but I wasn't into them. And so maybe, maybe by not being, you know, one of these kids who, like, when they're seven, they're like, oh, I want to be a poet. That wasn't me. I wanted to be a football player. Um but I was also deeply invested in retrospect, I can see in sort of the same things. And so like, you know, I, I was in I was interested in like really beautiful things. You know, I was interested in like, you know, the raspberries at the edge of the, of the um, field mm. that we would go harvest, or I was interested in the mulberry tree and like, in a way, like a little different than like, say my brother or some of the other kids in the neighborhood, mm. like, I'd go there and like harvest and like, it would be real, like in retrospect, it was a kind of aesthetic and, you know, a little bit, um, I don't know what the word is, but it was not, it was, it was adjacent to poetry. I also, as, a, as an athlete, like I was um, acutely aware of the performative aspects of playing football and playing. And so like, I had those kind of sensibilities. I also, like I said, I had these sort of sensibilities. I was sort of learning about things by the music that I was listening to. Mm. So although I wasn't like um, necessarily writing poems, I was thinking a lot about language, like thinking very mm -hmm. hard about language. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, and also like uh, the ways that, that me and my friends, I'm thinking especially my buddy Jay, like the ways that we were bad in school, like we were, we were like doing these kind of, pieces you know <laughs> we were always doing pieces <laughs> mm -hmm. and and i talk about it now like some of the just the dumb shit that we did as kids and i'm like man that was a piece like mm -hmm. if i did that now i'd call it a piece you know mm -hmm. um and just our naughtiness i just feel like oh you were like you were learning how to write a poem then you know you were learning mm -hmm. how to write a poem so 
you know, I don't know, just a different different thing. Yeah. Um, the, 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 we have a question. Have you heard from Dr. J about about the poem? Behold. <laughs> No, and, if but not, we gotta, why, and if not, why? <laughs> I know we got to get it to him. We got to get it to him. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I was reading. I was thinking. Oh, who? There was someone else I wanted to give this poem to. Um, while I was reading, maybe LeBron. Maybe I was thinking LeBron. Yeah. <laughs> who were you? Who were you uh, rooting for in the final? Jimmy Bucket. Yeah. I wanted Jim. Whatever. I wanted Jimmy <laughs> Butler. Um, but I was psyched. I mean, I was psyched. Yeah. I was. The Lakers were great, man. It's a really cool team. But I was I was just rooting for Jimmy Bucket. <laughs> um, well, uh, we we may have time for for one more if you do, Ross. Um, I did. I, yeah, I totally. Oh, did. okay. Um, let's see here. Um, um, where was I here? Um, we have a question. How do you keep intriguing and rhetorically conversing with the audience in, uh, in your work while still having uh, a, a moral to take away from those pieces? Um, is that is that thinking on the page, um, that that revising, that thinking through the rhetoric of how to say, like you said earlier today, you, you just love to revise sentences? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm not. Um, yeah. Can you say it one more time? I think I know. I, yeah. As, uh, how, how do you keep um, intriguing and rhetorically conversing with your audience while still having a solid moral to take away from the pieces? Yeah. You know, I feel like um, I tend not to think of having a moral to take away. Um, I think, but maybe that's not totally true. Um, but maybe what I'm interested in is sort of um, the experience. I mean, I might have said this earlier today, but like the, I'm interested in the the piece, whatever the essay or the poem, as a kind of artifact of a kind of thinking that I was trying to do. And the artifact then I'm giving, I'm, I'm sharing as as a way of probably being like, you know. Um, maybe, maybe there's a similar or analogous kind of experience that you might have from it. Um, so maybe the moral actually is a kind of sharing and reaching. Maybe that's the moral, but I wouldn't call it the moral. Like it's not mm -hmm. a, like a directive from the poem or the piece. Maybe it's just like the, the spirit um, or ultimate kind of concern, moral and otherwise, that I have for the piece. Um, but I think, yeah, I don't think... I don't think of, um, and, and also like, I don't think of like wanting, I love that question, the sort of rhetorical and the, uh, the conversational thing. I feel like maybe that conversational and rhetorical like work um, is a lot about being like, let's, let's think about this together, you know, mm -hmm. let's, let's hold this question together, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, I think that's a lot of, I think maybe that's a lot of what that is like the sort of, you know, the, um, the, the, the writing like that, the, what I'm doing in those writings. And I know like I'm trying to get closer and Iris Sadoff has this beautiful poem and it's called grazing. And in the mm -hmm. poem, there's this moment where he says, um, <laughs> he, he says, um, he says something, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, I'm trying to bring you closer. <laughs> he's basically like the line before was trying to bring you closer and he's like calling himself out for it but I am trying to bring you closer <laughs> and I think me trying to bring you closer is I mean that's kind of the ethics that's in part the ethics of the piece but it's also in the effort to think about a question together you know I think that's right I think that's right and I think that you know hearing your question and, and me immediately being like I don't have a kind of moral imperative Maybe there is a moral imperative and maybe the moral imperative is to try to like think together um, or maybe to be together, you know, uh, that's a good, that's a really good question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ebenezer, for the, the question. Um, well, I, I think that about brings us, brings us to time. Um, 
can't thank you enough uh, for for spending the, the whole day with us at WSU. Uh, uh, we're grateful, um, and thanks for your generosity. You had a great time. Thank you. Thank you. It's good. Um, thank you all for for joining us, and um, um, please uh, feel free to check out the WSU Visiting Writers Series website for our spring lineup of readings. Um, and thank you all for being with us. Have a good night. Stay safe, stay healthy.